Joining us today on the podcast is the ingenious Benjamin Smith, Executive Creative Director of the Maida Creative Company. With a track record of producing wildly successful marketing campaigns for the likes of Google, NFL and Radiohead, Ben is a creative mastermind like no other. Together, we're delving into the world of creative strategy and production and uncovering the secret source behind a killer campaign. I'm very proud of what you're doing. Smile for 15 seconds out of day and make the world a better place. Welcome to Everything is Better with Creators, brought to you by Whaler. Join us as we dive into the latest trends, news and strategies shaping the creator economy. Ben Smith, it's so lovely to have you with us at Everything is Better with Creators on our podcast. Um, Ben Smith, you are the Executive Creative Director at Maida, a really interesting agency. We'd love to obviously hear more about that agency and also about your career as well, working at some of the most incredible businesses like The Mill. Tell us a bit more about your background. Yeah, sure. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Lovely to be here. I come from a design and making background. My first love was product design. And when I was studying that back in the late 90s, I discovered 3D animation. I was introduced to it there as a kind of tool for product development. You know, much easier to stretch things and experiment with proportion virtually than sanding models in a, in a workshop. So I, I kind of became infatuated with that technology, that world building kind of blank canvas that you could do anything with. And I somewhat forgot about my product design career. Friends had started a company creating animation. They did a lot of work for documentaries where you sort of design and develop the explanatory parts. Um, But we ended up doing um, a Radiohead music video called uh, Like Spinning Plates, which I then um, took down to London because it was being finished at, at the mill, a company called the mill. The mill was like the yeah, you know, very the famous of, business, isn't very it? The mill? Very famous, very very well known. Yeah, and in the early two thousands or very late nineties, it was then. It was it was kind of the pinnacle of you know this new visual effects world, and I was you know super intrigued. So very excited to to go down there and meet everyone and, and kind of get this awesome music video that we'd worked with Johnny Hardstuff, the director, to create and finish it off there. So it was awesome. I got to meet everyone. And I suppose to cut a long story short, I ended up (laughs) staying at the mill for 18 years, which is amazing when you say it out loud. But of course, I had many different roles over that time. I I moved to um, New York, where I live now, in 05, and I helped set up the um, studio there. I was head of CGI. I was a visual effects supervisor. Uh, I got to work on the biggest and the best kind of, you know, campaigns there was in the noughties and the uh, tens. I suppose around 2009, I started directing commercials myself. And it was a natural response. Agencies kind of wanted us to do that for them. So I was lucky enough to to work on some really great projects. And then naturally, we started getting inquiries from brands. So brands would contact us, you know, a lot of things going on in the agency world. The landscape was shifting slightly. Technology had a a big part to play in that. And brands started approaching us and saying, can you help us, you know, develop concepts and make the work for such and such a campaign? So we, we formalized that ultimately as something that was a lot more, you know, strategic and creative development based, um, something that could plug into the very, you know, very well resolved making arm of the mill. So that's what I did for the last, you know, five or so years when I was at the mill. And two years ago, Myself and a few like-minded people left the mill and wherever else we were at uh, and started a new company called Maida, uh, which is kind of a continuation of that a smaller hybrid um, studio that blends art, technology, design thinking to create awesome stuff, whatever it may be. So it sounds like things started with music and then evolved into brands. I was going to say, you know, what are some of the campaigns, whether it's at the mill or made, what are some of the big campaigns you've worked on? But you've got to tell us a bit more as well about Radiohead. How was that experience? Because I know so many, every creative person would kill to work for Radiohead, right? It was a magic combination because it was, it was Radiohead at that time, right? In the late nineties, were just the coolest thing ever. Plus this amazing director, um, plus the mill. So it was like a dream come true. Yeah. Look it up. Like spinning plates. It's called. Cool. Which album was that on? 
It was after, I think it's Kid A. It was after, gosh, you're, you're testing I'll it look, now. I'll I, look I think it it's Kid A. Look, look it up, <laughs> like spinning plates. But yeah, I always loved advertising. Don't judge me for that, but I did. And I remember being massively confused by some of the commercials in the 90s. Do you, Tony K, do you remember Tony K style advertising? It was like high concept, high art, unattainable in many ways, but really leaning into kind of, you know, visual sophistication. It was about, you know, high quality, amazing visuals. So I was kind of enamored um, by that from the get go. Uh, I suppose that that was the modus operandi of the time. It's what brands look for, you know, quality in terms of, you know, visual fidelity meant success. It meant, you know, that you're doing something right. So in the nineties, I think it was very much centered around that. And when, when I started my career in 2000, pretty much there was this infatuation and as an extension of that, there was kind of this infatuation with magical realism, right? For, for the first time you were able to incorporate visual effects and high end invisible visual effects into commercials. You know, it'd been coming for a while in film. It was happening when I, when I first went to the mill, they were working on the Harry Potter films and Black Hawk Down. And so th these were like big budget, you know, Hollywood films that where there was tons of invisible visual effects within them. And so at, around that time, you could start to do the same thing in the commercial, commercial world, right? It was still expensive. It still took time and so on, but it was like, it was like a new tool. There were a lot of scripts around that time that were rooted in kind of, magical realism, right? These, you know, incredible uses of, of visual effects and CGI characters. Cause the first time you could actually do that, you know, with, with proper fidelity, um, you know, within the budgets that people were, were spending. So I got to work on some awesome stuff. I th do, do you remember PlayStation mountain? That, I mean, that's a crazy idea, a literal mountain of people <laughs> climbing over one another, right. As a metaphor for, for online gaming, In, insane concept, you know, and honestly challenging to produce, especially back in 2004, but stands as, a, as an awesome piece of work that I think represents, you know, that, that period of time. So it was, it's been a really a blend of sort of what entertainment as well as advertising and brand stuff that you've been, you've been working on that's really been, you know, central to your career, Ben. How have, how have things evolved? How have you seen the way brands are communicating evolve from the 90s to the noughties to the 10s, as you say? How have you seen that evolution? Because you mentioned around this idea that things were then quite aspirational, almost out of touch or was out of reach if, in some ways. That, that was how brands kind of wanted to be. Did, did you see that's changed now as we, look, as we look to now into the future? But how have you seen that evolve over the years? I mean, I suppose the thing about that time was that it was new, right? And, and it was like the shiny new toy that people wanted to explore and play with. Um, and because it was new, it had value. It was also, you know, hard and expensive, therefore. But that kind of visual fidelity, the sophistication and image making isn't new anymore, right? And it hasn't been for a while. It's, it's kind of a given that you can, if you can think it, you can make it, right? And the, the value of those skill sets and being able to produce that type of work, you know, has gone down truthfully because it's ubiquitous for one people's um, understanding of it is much more sophisticated too. So there's definitely been a swing towards much more grounded and real um, work, right? Where it's, you know, especially today, it's much more about inclusivity and human stories and trying to make um, brands and products relatable not far-fetched, not fantastical, but much more kind of centered around real issues and real people. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly seeing that from a from a social perspective, you know, this idea that, you know, people want to experience something that feels more, something more real rather than something that does seem completely unattainable or, dare I say it, false or negative in some way. So it's definitely that that's the way things are going. And there's a place for both, right? There's a place for both of those things. It's just, it's a broader kind of spread now, I'd say. So Ben, why do you think the quality of content, content is an important factor for consumers to trust a brand? On a really basic level, if something looks bad, what does it say about your brand, I suppose? But then how something looks is obviously an output of, you know, strategy and 
design thinking because ultimately it's a subjective term, right? That what, what you define as quality is different for each brand and each sort of case of advertising within that brand. Um, I don't, you know, for me, visual, visual sophistication pulls you in. You know, it's something that, that grabs your eye and, and yeah, pulls you in, makes you want to watch it. But I mean, quality doesn't necessarily mean, you know, high production value, right? It could be funny or beautiful or, you know, enlightening or relatable, some other quality that is important for that brand that they've identified as the thing that they need to, to kind of um, speak about or, or live within in order to resonate with the, the audience that they're going for. And you only get to that, right, through asking the right questions and, you know, applying a process and the rigor of that um, to, to define what is important and then, you know, develop from that point the, the work you're going to make. And what do you think brands are adding, Ben, to their creative briefs that weren't there before? Do you think there's been a change to whether it's the storylines, the messaging? How are creative briefs changing now in today's modern world? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, you know, a, a clear and necessary move towards inclusion, which is, you know, only a good thing. The, the deliverables, the kind of, you know, what people want now is obviously way more <laughs> complex than it used to be. Life used to be so simple. It was, you know, a, a commercial and some print. <laughs> but obviously it's much more blended, much more kind of atomized the days. now. <laughs> the good old days, yeah. <laughs> also the bad old days, you know, in, in many ways. But in terms of deliverables, it certainly was a lot easier. You know, that affects a lot of the decision making you go through when you're first of all, ideating a project, but then, you know, when you're actually executing something, if you don't shoot for all the deliverables that you know you're going to need to deliver, it can really trip you up later. And it really does affect the choices that you make. For example, you wouldn't, it would be hard to choose to shoot something with anamorphic lenses if you knew you were going to have to do, you know, one by ones and nine by 16s, because it, it just becomes impossible and, and, a, and quite a nasty kind of, you know, post-production process to, to fix that and produce it. So knowing that all of those, you know, different formats are, are fundamental to an omni-channel campaign as they often are these days, then yeah, you, you really have to think about it. But I've had some interesting um, examples of how, well, for example, like we did a thing last year with Joe Jonas, so a celebrity film. And we had to we had to allocate time in the shooting schedule so that he could get the stuff that he needed for his social channels, right? Which is totally relevant and and important, right? But it becomes almost a sort of collaboration in a sense because we need stuff to get for the for the film, but then he needs to get some for his channels. Which is more important? Who knows? But they're both relevant. They're both important, and they're both on the schedule. For music artists, particularly, it's it's a, such a hard thing because they're trying to make music and do everything that's associated with that. But they also now need to have their own, you know, really buoyant, engaging social media platforms. I think that's such a challenge for artists actually now. What, what do you think, Ben? What can brands do to really create that quality video content? What do you, you know, is it about, is it about the right strategy? Is it, is it the storyline? How should a brand be thinking when they're thinking, right, I want to commission an amazing piece of video, an amazing asset. What's, what are the ingredients to that? I mean, so many, right? It's, it's such a varied uh, case by case answer. Again, that's a lot to do with asking the right questions defining, you know, what's important for the audience that you're trying to reach, what's going to move the needle for them, basically. And, and actually, you know, if you think about the creator economy and working with creators in that sense, that's massively powerful, right? Because you're, you're shortcutting a lot of the unknowns and getting inside the tent, so to speak, and, you know, speaking through them or with them to an audience that, you know, knows that person, respects that person, trusts that person. And it works the other way too, right? The, the sort of agency model, the dark arts of the agency, which are you know increasingly <laughs> visible. The process of discovering insight and then building on that as a you know a platform and a starting point for um, development. It, it just it, it's so different each time. I think it's about finding that insight, finding that nugget that will you think is going to resonate either through a creator or you know by traditional means, and then building on that. 
and that that's when it really comes together right when it becomes a really valuable piece of content that, that resonates and does move the needle yeah it's super interesting i was met with a, a a new business recently a climate business and they're trying to educate you know potential people to hopefully fund this business to you know to get involved and they want to produce an asset and actually it's so important this video asset which will become their their tool to hopefully get lots of people funding this business and it's going to be so interesting for them because that asset is so important and getting the storytelling right the music right the messaging right the copy the tone the power of that as- asset could really sort of make or break in some ways so there's just so many dynamics to it and then when you do see such a amazing quality video if you do see something like that that does impact and has measurable impact I think that that's really where the magic happens. And there's, as you say, there's just so many elements to that. Um, but it's such a challenging thing for brands, businesses to think about. How do you get that perfect piece of quality video content? And, it, and it's constantly a moving target. Right? It's changing all the time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's about emotion, right? If you can, if you can cut through the noise and, and produce something that makes your audience feel something, whatever that is, humor, love, empathy. Um, in an entertaining way, then, then you know you've done something right. Yeah, and as you say, on a practical level, if, if it does move the needle in terms of sales or engagement or whatever, then that's one measure. But I think the thing we all strive for, right, and the thing we should strive for is a human impact. You know, does it inspire? Does it delight? Does it enlighten in some way that changes people in some way and, and moves them on a bit? Sometimes I'm, I'm involved in judging awards and I try and look at videos and I try and think, does it sort of transcend? Does it kind of, yeah, does it go beyond even the, the target audience or who it was intended for? How does it really make people feel? Um, and the power of video, uh, it, you know, it's just, yeah, if you, if you can get that right, it, it can just have so much impact. What makes a campaign video good content? Like if you see a campaign video, what makes you think, wow, you, I mean, you've talked about emotion. Is it also about, you know, really relevance to that target audience that it's going for? What would you say that, are, that makes you think, yeah, that's good? As you say, like the best pieces of content are a confluence of all of these different ingredients coming together to produce some, something magical, right? And it, it's pretty rare that it, all of those things connect and it, it becomes that transcendent piece of content. Um, but it does happen. I've been involved in a few, thankfully. But it's, it's a hard thing to, to pin down because, it, you know, for me, I, I love beauty and design. And when I see work that shows me something I hadn't seen before in a, in a very beautiful way, I get super excited by that. Let's talk about any campaigns that have really stood out to you in this past year and why. Anything that you've seen that you've thought, wow, that stopped you in your tracks? The thing that really stands out to me is kind of none of those things, funnily enough. And it's actually, a, it's a little while ago, but it, it resonated so well with me because of what's happening. And I think that there's so many lessons to be learned from it. I think it was 2021. It was the, it was the Super Bowl ad that Reddit did. Do you remember? It was like a five second glitch. Probably the best example of disruptive marketing ever. And the reason it was so good was because it tapped into, you know, something real in culture in that moment. The whole Wall Street bet subreddit and GameStop. And it was about challenging the, the status quo, the, the norm of Wall Street. You know, they, there was this groundswell of support for this beloved brand and they challenged the, you know, the establishment in Wall Street. And that five second glitch commercial did the same thing to Super Bowl. It was like the antithesis of a Super Bowl commercial. It was five seconds. It was static. It was a glitch, but it resonated with so many people because it tapped into that culture. And I think that's an important lesson, right? Is if you can find a, a, a way in an angle on a genuine piece of culture, what's happening in the world right now and reflect that back in a enlightened way, then you're doing something right. It also, and this is what I, I also loved about it was that it drove people to the superb owl subreddit, an anagram of Super Bowl. And it, it was, it, which is just about the majesty of owls, which I thought was just genius. Amazing kind of, you know, take on, 
you know, kind of poking fun at the Super Bowl in a way. It was like for the people, by the people, um, this real sort of grass, grassroots groundswell of a thing, which I absolutely loved. I thought it was incredible. I also like more recently the the design to be deleted ad for Hinge, you know, the, the dating app. That's one of our clients, actually. Yeah, they yeah, love that. Design to be deleted. It's very good, isn't it? It's an excellent strategy. Such a simple insight. Right, that this brilliant product is designed to be deleted. You, you will. It's so good, you will no longer need it soon because you will find love. Um, I think it's yeah. It flips the kind of you know that category on its head, and yeah, a brilliant insight. That's you know it's executed well. The the production is is fine too. There's a nice bit of you know design and performances are good and all the rest of it. But the the concept, the nub, the heart of that, no pun intended, um, it is so pure that. That inspires me, you know, and I think it, it resonates around the world because even if you don't recognize that and you don't think about, oh, wow, that's an incredible piece of insight, it, it just feels right and it connects because it's, it's so clever and so simple. They've done some great work, Hinge. They did a campaign with us uh, on TikTok, which was about the idea of instead of red flags, this idea of green flags, things about people that you thought were great. And it was a really positive campaign, actually. It worked really well for the medium of TikTok, this idea of finding people that in, and having these green flags and excitement towards meeting people. So I do think they do some great work. And actually, they're very good at the, the concept of this like big idea, this n- nice, big, chunky, big idea, which I always love. I still love that about when you see brands doing that, a big brand mission, a big idea that everything hinges around, literally. They're a real brand to watch. They're doing some really good stuff. Let's talk about sort of social and the way things are going in terms of algorithms and, you know, the Googles, the YouTubes, the TikToks, the Instagram. Have you particularly worked on many, you know, campaigns or on content that's been specifically for a, a social platform? And, and has that been a very different approach to more of the maybe the traditional stuff that you've talked about, whether it's the music videos or the films or the ads? Has the social stuff been approached in a slightly different way? Yeah, definitely. And I, I have one example, which is entirely driven by data and it, it's been brilliantly successful, thankfully. But yeah, a, a completely different way to come into a concept. We created it a four hour spot, believe it or not, specifically for YouTube, four hours because that there's a there's a trend on YouTube called lo-fi beats, um, which is basically chill, relaxing kind of hip hop ish music over top of very simple, very beautiful, often kind of Japanese anime inspired animation. Again, this is a a cultural trend. This is happening. People love it. The strategy was was formed around you know data insights. Google identified that the, the kind of demographic and the length of time that people spent um, listening and engaging with this type of content was very, very appropriate to um, Nissan as they were launching their new all-electric car, the Aria. Um, so they wanted to kind of tap into that world and create a piece of culture that was, you know, in many ways, you know, indistinguishable from the real stuff that people are watching which is an amazing brief. So with our friends over at Titmouse, the animation guys, we created this wonderful piece of a, a girl driving, you know, past beautiful Japanese landscapes. Um, it's full of kind of Easter eggs, kaiju and mythical creatures appear and disappear as she's driving. And it's, it's been great. It's, it's had amazing responses. There's 3.4 million views. Um, and we only launched it a, a few weeks ago. Some of the responses on, um, you know, in the chat have been fantastic. Shall I, can I read a few? There's so many good ones. But that it, as, as someone involved in, you know, concepting and developing work, to, to have that sort of feedback is, is amazing. Imp City Angel says, the fact that I looked for this ad means that the marketing team deserve a raise. I agree. Um, Charlie Jones says, this is how commercials should be not designed to annoy people or interrupt people, but provide them with a pleasant experience which they associate with the product, which is just bang on, isn't it? That, that is how the younger generation view, I mean, not, not even just the younger generation, like that's how people want advertising to be. And, you know, so pleasing to see that um, as a result of something that we developed that 
you know, it was designed to be that. It was designed to be culture, not advertising. Kind of the holy grail, right? That is. I mean, I love that. And it's so, yeah, congratulations on that. So nice, isn't it? That's, that's just the joy of sort of social and have, being able to see that feedback. It's, it's funny. We often use our chairman. So he, he talks about um, principles remain, practices change. In the end, everything is always about, you know, it, I, I love the way you're thinking, you know, it's, it's still about finding that insight. It doesn't matter what platform, you know, it, you've still got those principles, even though the practices, wherever it goes, you you still got to be very, um, it, that finding that piece of insight is so important. And then how you then bring that to life. And we often talk at Whaler about being part of culture and not being part of the category. And as you say, finding yourself in these communities and giving something to those communities that's actually really interesting and, and, and totally in tune to how they're thinking and feeling. And as you say, being part of culture in that, like, in that lovely way that gets people quite excited about the brand. And it sounded like you really achieved that. So, yeah, congratulations. That sounds, I'll definitely look that up. The, the future is, is well, and the present, but certainly the future is much more blended, right? The, you, you need lots of different, skill sets and lots of different, you know, diverse types of thinking in order to be flexible enough to, to innovate on any platform, in any medium. That's something we, we talk about a lot is being platform agnostic. And I totally agree with, with that sentiment. Practices change, principles remain. Exactly right. It's, and that to me is design thinking. You know, it's using intellect, creativity with a good understanding of what's possible to develop, you know, elegant responses to needs and briefs and whatever it may be. But it, it's, not, it's not always film. It's not always animation. It's not always the, the traditional mediums that we consider because in, in responding to whatever need or brief there is intelligently, you've got to be open to whatever it is. And, you know, there's just an increasing number of formats, mediums, positions where you know, content and brands need to be because they, they need to be at the spaces where culture is happening. And that just means so many different things now. And what an opportunity there is now to, you know, this idea of, you know, the nicheification of audiences, this idea that all these sort of burgeoning communities are happening where people are coming together. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's there and it's happening. And I, I love the example that you, you, you mentioned about Reddit, actually, because you know, when we often think about strategy, we often think about, you know, this idea of product truths, the consumer truth, the category truth, what's happening and how do you find the space for you to tell your story? And I love the fact that Reddit, that sounds to me like it was so in tune to their community and something that probably just captured and sparked so much joy with that community to see that actually. Um, they knew themselves, they knew their truths and they found that truth and they lived that truth. And yeah, and that, that's, that is where the magic happens, isn't it? And I love that example, Ben. Thank you. So culture's changing. So is marketing. What are you sort of noticing about storylines and casting that are in campaigns versus before? Obviously, you talked a lot about inclusivity. Is there anything else that you're seeing there? Any big trends, themes in terms of the casting of campaigns. The things are definitely more inclusive, right? I mean, which can only be a good thing. People want to see people like them, right? It, it totally makes sense and is obvious and unbelievable that it's kind of, we're still talking about this and it's taken this long to, to actually affect any sort of change. But it, I feel like it is changing. You know, at the concepting stage, those issues are, you know, talked about on a level playing field. Um, so, you know, that naturally has a positive impact on character development and casting and all of those things. But it's also interesting, you know, brands and agencies are now stipulating that there is diversity behind the camera too, which again is, can only be a good thing. Um, so the teams in the, you know, in the production or, you know, in the studios during post-production need also to be diverse, um, which is often a hard ask, to be honest. Um, but, but something, you know, we're at Meta definitely trying to address. One of the cool projects that we're working on now is in part directly aimed at kind of challenging that. What we're working on is a, it's a, a new festival that's launching this year in New York. It's called Let's Get Free. 
part of its challenge to the world is about um, the inequality, the lack of diversity that exists in pretty much all forms of media and entertainment. Right? There's a lot um, of fairly frightening stats that they talk about, about the lack of representation in the music industry, for example. N not talking about the artists and the, the, you know, the performers who you, you see and hear, but the people backstage, the people who, you know, the myriad of jobs that go into producing music or all aspects of the music industry, same for film, same for sports. Um, so the thing that we, we've been challenged with is made, as Maida is to create a digital extension to that physical experience, which is in New York, so it can reach a much broader global community um, and bring those messages, challenge the status quo. And um, a big part of it is also education, like creating um, experiences and, you know, things that can help, genuinely help the next generation get a foothold into those industries, you know, and start to really address that inequality, which is, such a great concept, you know, it's a wonderful project to be involved with. Um, and, and hopefully that will change things because, you know, the, the inequality that exists, you know, cannot continue. And there's, there's work to be done in all aspects. Still lots of work to be done, but lots of good stories and green shoots and, yeah, moving in the right direction, it sounds. I mean, just thinking about this idea of the younger generation, if you like, the Gen Zs and younger than the Gen Zs and what their expectations are now of brands, businesses, companies and how they communicate. You know, it's so important because the younger generation, this is what they expect. This is all they know. They want to see things in a way that doesn't feel so perfect. How are you leaning into this kind of idea that this generation, as well as inclusivity, they also want real authenticity as well in the work and the content they're seeing it, it, to engage with something. How are you guys really leaning into that at Maida? It's, it's a, a defining feature, isn't it? The authenticity of, of now and, you know, has been for a while. Um, I, I'm not necessarily convinced that lack of perfection and authenticity are mutually exclusive, right? I think you can have both or one or the other, um, but I totally take the point and it it's honestly it's something i struggle with the kind of just get it out there whatever it looks like just get it out there it doesn't matter you know our, our social team at Maida, they're you know naturally a, a little younger um and they're always saying that it doesn't matter what you do it's more important to post and get something out there than stress about it being perfect perfection spells paralysis right is the is the quote but my whole career has been around you know we used to call it pixel effing, right? It's about create, striving for perfection in whatever you're doing and creating massively polished, you know, beautiful art in a sense. Um, so I, genuinely, I do kind of struggle with it, but that's why you, you bring people in, actually. And one thing we're actively doing um, is, is building a, a network, a diverse network of creatives from this generation who kind of implicitly understand those dynamics because it's, it's what they know, it's what they've grown up with um and our idea is to kind of use our experience as creators and producers and so on to almost underwrite them and give them a start in the industry it's talked about a lot diversity in thinking not just diversity in you know skin color but diversity in thinking and age um naturally leads to innovation and that that's what everyone really wants isn't it is to innovate and break through and find the next thing whatever it may be I mean, I think this is clearly the role of creators because you can have this still this lovely, this idea of this broadcast piece. And then you have this almost this narrow cast, this ability to bring it into creators, let them communicate it, let them bring the storytelling, the diversity of thought, of ideas, of, of the breadth of uh, imaginative content that only they can deliver at scale. You know, that's where these I think creators working actually very closely with more traditional creative agencies, that's really where you can get that lovely blend. And I think we'll see more of that. And we're certainly seeing it more at Whaler, where we're working, dare I say it, with the more traditional creative agencies who are incredible at producing the big TV ads, the, the super slick, uh, highly produced. And then, right, OK, how do we now bring that into 
the communities? How do we make that social? And I think that is such an exciting role for creators and they then bring that authenticity to it. So it, 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 it can actually work really, really well. They're almost like creative directors, right? They are. They are becoming creative directors. Absolutely. With or without an agency, you know, it, it's totally makes sense. It's very smart for, for agencies to bring them in sometimes and, you know, have their input to a process because it, like we said before, it's a shortcut to authenticity. We often talk about, we use this, you know, off the mood boards and into the boardrooms. And actually we, we try and encourage brands and agencies to really, you know, sit around a table with these creators because they are, they are in the culture. They're, they're in these platforms. They, they speak the language of their audience, actually, which is quite hard to do, actually, especially when you're thinking Gen Z. You know, they speak the language and, you know, and I, why wouldn't you work with them and work with them more strategically? You know, we do, uh, we're doing a fair bit of work with Mother at the moment. And actually, I do love the way they're, they're really thinking about this. Um, because they work with so many big, you know, global clients, but they're really thinking, okay, how do we then, how do we then build these relationships with creators as well? So if you could, if you could creatively direct a brand's upcoming campaign, which brand would it be and why? And what would your campaign look like? Probably like a a big tech brand or a, a gaming company, maybe like Riot, maybe, or NVIDIA. NVIDIA, the, the, the company that makes graphics cards, they, those guys are doing so many incredible things with AI and machine learning, you know, that, that have been published and out there as new tools, very exciting new tools that you can play with and explore. But I'm sure there's tons of stuff behind the curtain that we haven't seen yet. That, that would be a fun project to look behind that curtain and, you know, get, get to kind of write scripts and campaigns using the magic stuff that they're making. Um, I, I guess that's what inspires me a lot of the time, right? Is leaning into discovering, exploring new techniques and, you know, having fun with them and discovering what you can do with them. Uh, and that comes, I don't, I don't know if they do advertising NVIDIA. I'll have to look. The, the raw materials that you could play with that are specifically, you know, generated by them would be amazing. Oh, that sounds awesome. I was reading about a Google campaign that they're doing this thing called a project rebrief where they're taking kind of the, the old school ads and bringing them the famous ads of the 90s, etc. And then bringing those to creators to remake them. So there's there's things like that as well. That <laughs> I think actually I would love to see that. Because of the design of those cards, it's very, very um, you know, useful for machine learning. So a lot of they themselves have developed a, a lot of kind of machine learning algorithms that specifically use their architecture on their cards. And it's, it's such an exciting area. There's so many cool things um, coming out. Nerf, so I don't know if you've heard of them, neural radiance fields. That, that's going to be like a new thing coming that it's a way of kind of recreating volumes of space um, in a completely you know, novel way maintains lighting direction and you know the, the dynamics of a scene as opposed to just photogrammetry just taking pictures of it and seeing it but that I'm, I'm going into details here but there have so many interesting um parallel fronts in using machine learning because they've developed the technology in order to do that um yeah it, it's very very exciting the machine learning side of things and then all of the targeting and the 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 possibilities in that for creative at scale is just insane. And that's, that's another podcast, Ben, isn't it? I mean, it, it really is. From our perspective, from a creative perspective, you know, the opportunity to work with tons of different niche creators and then use all of that machine learning to then target all of that to different customers, people. I think that, yeah, that's another podcast. It really is. I have mixed feelings, but. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> So Ben, how can creators show us about creating marketing content for audiences today that others wouldn't know? Is there anything you've observed about, you know, the way creators work particularly? I almost think of it as like this giant petri dish, right, of like people exploring and iterating and failing and succeeding. And, you know, you can sort of stand on the outside and look in 
and it's just this hive of activity of of people trying stuff you know so things evolve naturally and you know for brands and for other creators being part of that and witnessing it, it it's like this experimentation machine right that where naturally things pop out of it and become viral so if you're listening carefully enough and and you're looking in the right places those things you can jump onto and then evolve them yourself and leverage that kind of new beginning um, for your brand or your project or whatever. So I would say the the willingness to share, like the sort of cornerstone of social media, right? This drive to post what you're doing, to share it with the world has just accelerated creativity in, in so many aspects because it, it's just happening in real time, in parallel, everywhere in the world. And therefore things evolve faster, you know, and things pop out and Magic, magic is uncovered all the time. And yeah, like I say, if, you, if you're paying attention, you can see it and then use that or use a variation of it in what you're doing as a brand, as a creator, as an animator, as an artist, as a whatever. But it's, it's an engine of creativity and social media is the window through which we look at it. These creators are such points of light everywhere they are. They're just, you know, there's so many different types of creator now. It's so different to the world of which was much more associated with, you know, influencer marketing. You know, when we think about these creators out there now building these communities, so creative in their output and the way they're bringing their worlds, you know, they're showcasing their worlds to, to, to the world. It's, yeah, there's just... So, so much creativity out there. AI is going to add rocket fuel to that, right? Because the thing about AI, and I do have mixed feelings about it, is that it, it's a, it's a de-skilling. I mean, technology generally is about, you know, take, taking away burden from human, removing learned skills and just, you know, taking care of something. AI removes the need in many ways to learn about image production that, the, the nuances and structure of art and animation, because all the tools that exist now and you know even more so in the future are just going to do it for you, which in the one sense is amazing for the creator economy, right? Because people will suddenly be able to do whatever they want and make it look like however they want. But it's also terrifying because you just, all the people that studied their whole lives to do the thing that they love are now, you know, not value less, but their value has decreased because the opportunity to be able to make that stuff exists for everyone. As our chairman says to John Hegarty, you know, we can all be artists, but not all of us should exhibit, which is probably true, isn't it here? Which unfortunately, may, yeah, so we shall see how that goes. Um, that, yeah, I completely agree with you. That's, that's definitely a, a concern there, isn't it? So Ben, um, is there anything that you, you've learned about creating content for today's market from a creator or creator campaign that you're using in your work? You know, has, has the creator economy impacted, you know, your production process or the way you think about producing content for brands or, you know, partners? Absolutely. And, and I think this goes back to the beginning of that last conversation about social media. You know, the, the best thing about it is that people share how they're doing stuff. So every day, I'm looking on Patreon and YouTube and watching other creators' technique and process and understanding how they did the thing to inform my process, you know, to fill gaps in my knowledge or to be inspired by what they've done um, so that I can do whatever I'm trying to do in a better way. For anyone interested in making anything, <laughs> particularly for software-related projects, right, that cultural shift and the platforms that exist in that sense, it, it's a total game changer. I would say I'm constantly using techniques, knowledge, the approaches of many, many, many different creators that are out there because they're, they're willing to share. You know, Patreon for a small sum of money, you can get inside, you know, the studio of these wonderful artists and creators and see how they do it. It's, it's mind blowing. And, and not just for that, right? A few summers ago, I built a deck in my swampy, muddy backyard and I built a wooden deck over it. I had no idea how to build a wooden deck, but I learned everything I needed to know from social media and made a deck, which is, which is crazy when you think about it. Good old YouTube video. They come in handy, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to get Ben to one of yeah, the, uh, my favorite. Well, it's the last segment. It's not my, fa my favorite segment, but we're going to get to our sink, sell and swim 
segment. So this is where we want you to tell us a little bit about Swim, what's working well from a brand content perspective, sell, what's amazing or on the rise and sync, what isn't working in the industry and why. So I'm going to start off with Swim. What's working well branded content wise and why, Ben? I think as a general observation, right, the, the, the model that we're all engaged with now is, is working well. The fact that, you know, companies make platforms and release tools for, you know, content creators and, and everyone to build content for those platforms is working. And as we talked about, it, you know, it's such a game changer in so many ways. And I'm really excited about the future of that. You know, we're doing a lot of um, work and exploration into metaverse-like experiences. Um, and the, the platforms and tool sets provided by those platforms now are amazing. Think about, you know, Fortnite and the Sandbox and Spatial. Like, there's, there's so many great tool sets for creators to make stuff already and publish to those platforms. But the next generation of those are going to be even more exciting. I know sort of Web3 and Metaverse has become a bit of a, a dirty word, but you know, we're still heading in that direction. It's still going to happen. And the strain, the variety of content creation on those platforms is on the rise. Uh, and I think that, that's a super interesting area. The emerging platforms, I, I, I'm super excited from a creative perspective about what we can do on the, the Fortnites and the Roblox. And well, I say they're emerging, but they're actually the biggest platforms out there from an audience perspective. I mean, Fortnite, Fortnite is c colossal, isn't it? It's crazy saying that, isn't it? Fortnite are about to release, or sometime this year, the, the, the version two of their creator tool set. Um, which I really think is going to be a game changer. Okay, so let's let's go. That that leads nicely into sale. What is amazing or on the rise, and why? Oh, well, definitely all of that stuff. I had a really interesting call with um, Google Labs the other day. So they've just their their new geospatial API is in uh, beta now. There's a an experience in Times Square in New York, and I think in London as well by the Gorillas, which is using this. It's the first example of this. Um, and it's, it's so clever. It's so cool. And I think what, what we're going to see in the future is lots more experiences branded or otherwise that, that are using that tool. So they AR experiences in locations that use the architecture of the space in all, and play with it in order to create these um, interesting experiences. That's, that's very exciting. Love that, Ben. Yeah, I see this whole idea of more experiences, brand experiences coming to life in those spaces and blending outdoor worlds with metaverse worlds going to be that's going to be super interesting. And then think what isn't working in the industry and why? Celebrity endorsements for brands. Very, very sus, says my 13 year old daughter. <laughs> but I, I agree. It just it feels so wrong today there's no celebrity endorsements why be told by a celeb to, to do something when you can be told by a real person it's true isn't it? it i think when those it's inauthentic or it feels fake now it just actually does feel pretty obtuse doesn't it there's definitely something about it that kind of makes you cringe that, that's the word cringe or sus right <laughs> to to speak the gen z parlance no for, from a creator perspective you know we just see you know, we talked, uh, we've talked, we've used the word magic a few times through this interview. And I think we see the magic happening, especially in these much smaller communities, which are more, I guess it's more akin to like a big group chat than it is just like this mass kind of, you know, celebrity post, if you like, you know, real engagement is really happening in these communities. There's obviously a time and a place for everything, but I, I do agree. It has to be the right the right talent and the right brand otherwise it, it there is there is something jarring about it well ben thank you so much for giving us a, a deep dive into the world of content and creativity and production and you know thank you for taking us into your world and your career it's such an interesting career you've worked with some amazing brands and different companies and businesses so thank you so much for taking us into your world and um we've loved having you thank you ben smith oh thank you emma i appreciate it been fun thanks a lot everything is better with creators is honored to be part of the ad week podcast network and acast creator network and we're grateful for your support 
If you enjoyed the show, hit that subscribe button. And if you have a moment, we'd appreciate a rating and review. To keep up with all things Whaler and the latest in the creator economy, visit us at whaler.com and follow us on Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. This is Emma Harmon signing off for now. We'll catch you next time with another episode of Everything is Better with Creators, powered by Whaler. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.